The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Kelly Bryant. Kelly found fame in the all-girl band Eternal in the 1990s and studied at the Italia Conti Academy. Today, she is a wife and mother and continues to act and work as a presenter. She is a patron of the St. Thomas Lupus Trust, and at the Best You Expo, she shared her passion for helping others to realize their talents. Kelly is a beautiful lady, a lovely soul that basically has a phenomenal and inspiring story. She spoke at her first expo, and I had the great opportunity to do this live interview a few years ago, and uh, it was just a beautiful one. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much. Um, hi. Welcome. I'm Bernardo Moya and welcome to Inspiring People. Today I've got an absolute pleasure of interviewing live uh, Kelly Bryan, who's a singer, uh, she's an actor, an entrepreneur and an amazing, amazing individual. So hi Kelly, thank hi. you so much for being here. Is that me that you were talking about? Just Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell me a little bit about your early years, where you were born and what was the early years of Kelly like? Oh, that's a good question to start off with. Um, well, my early years were quite interesting because I was, um, at age two, um, I did a Miss World competition. Don't ask me what you do at age two doing a World, Miss World competition, but I basically walked up and down on the stage and turned around, came back, and uh, on the night there was a dance teacher there, and she said, oh, your, your daughter's got lots of talent. My mum was like, doing what exactly? But anyway, so she said, oh, you know, you should come and join um, my dance school, and kind of that's where my career sort of started. Um, so, yeah, it kind of started from, from winning a junior Miss World competition. So you didn't wait around? I didn't know. Uh, straight, straight Age up. two, straight in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what was school like for you? Well, that same teacher and it leads me nicely on to what happened. So that same teacher was a teacher at Italia Conti, which is a stage school. And um, and at that point, you know, I'd come from a, I guess, a, underprivileged background, you know, and I never knew it because I always had the best meals and the best clothes, And but I, unbeknownst to me, it was my mum and dad that were going without. But, you know, when you're a kid, you don't realise, do you? You just think, I'm all right, I've got a nice pair of shoes, I've got a nice house, I've got a roof over my head. But I didn't realise the struggles that my mum and dad were going through to actually give me those kinds of um, privileges, which they are privileges. And so... Um, this teacher came up to my mum and dad and said, look, I think your, 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 your daughter's got talent. She should go to Italia Conti. It's a really good stage school for people that are talented like your daughter. Yeah. And, of course, I'm thinking, my mum and dad are thinking, well, this is great, but we, how much does this cost? It's a private school, right? And so they tell my mum and dad the price, and my mum goes, well, we, unfortunately, we can't afford that. But um, they said they did scholarships. And so then my mum applied for a scholarship to Newham Council and um, they immediately said no. And my mum was like, really? Well, we'll see about the no, won't we? That, and that's where I got my determination from. You can hear that straight away, right, from my mum. So then we, we carried on, we applied, and, and then I, I was able to go to Italia Conti Stage School, which is where I got my training. And you became a dancer? Well, I, yeah, I qualified as a dance teacher. I met people like Louise Redknapp and I went to school um, in, a, in a very privileged environment, but I was, the, I was always the odd one out because, you know, I didn't get picked up in a car every, every night. I was on the train and, you know, it, but it was really grounding and that's kind of where I found a lot of my um, tenacity and determination because at school it was like, you know, you'll never amount to anything, you're too black, you're too fat, you're too this, you won't be a dancer because of your shape, you won't, you know, I was told all of those things. So it was, you know, really good character building years. Mm. Was there anyone that particularly helped you or inspired you in your early years? 
You know what, what, what inspired me in the, the early years is that, I was, is that I was told no so many times. You know, everybody else would be up at the office getting auditions and castings other than me. And, and I just remember feel, feeling like, well, you didn't put me here. You know, they didn't put me here at school, so I knew I needed to fight extra hard. And at that point, you know, um, black entertainers were not other than... Well, let me just tell you the story. This is just a... a, <laughs> yeah. just a, just a but I had Naomi Campbell's textbook because she went to my school. So I remember going, fudge, I've got Naomi Campbell's textbook. This has got to be... You know what I mean? This must mean that I've... I can do it if she's done it. Do you know what I mean? And I thought, she's amazing. She's this big... At the, at the time, she was a big, massive star. And I was thinking, I don't look like Naomi Campbell, but surely I can make it because she's done it, you know? So it was, it, it was moments like that that kept me going. My actual school environment wasn't... There wasn't that one single teacher that, that really... Most of my teachers were quite like fame, you know, like... This is where fame starts. That kind of people with whips and it was all a bit like that. It was all... It, no, it really was like that, you know. And so I was always like, oh, sorry, oh, yeah, breathe in, Kelly. Uh, you know, always trying to fit the mould of everybody else because I was just, you know, clearly not meant to be there yeah. in any way, shape and form. <laughs> so how did it all come around? When it, How did you come... Because I know it's yeah. you and... and, and... Le- yeah, and Lou. Were, you were picked for... It's yeah, around, they, so, they were looking at creating a band, were they? It's, it's never really great when I tell this story. So I was in the club and I was underage clubbing. OK, fine. So that's out of the way. You and Louise. Yeah. yeah, this is Lou and I. And we'd saved up all our pocket money over, like, the years to save up for the right shoes and, the right, you know, get past the guards. Because, you know, at th- those days, it was really strict. You couldn't get into a club. So we were like, right, so we're going to wear hot pants. And we, anyway, I've actually got pictures from that night, and it's very sad. But anyway, we did, all, we did our best to get in, and we did. Um, and just getting past the doors, we were like, yes, amazing, we've done it. We're in a club, brilliant. So we get out there and we're having a great time. And anyway, this guy comes up to Louise and he goes, um, hi, my name's Dennis Inglesby. Please take my card now. Remember, we're like, what, 15? Right? So we're like, oh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. We're dancing around our handbags in, you know, and having a great time at this time. And so we take, he takes, we take the card and we discover that he... He, this is at school. Sorry, this is another really bad story, Bernard. But oh, I'm at oh, school and we bunk off, we bunk off our lesson because we're bored, right? So there's me getting all of this lovely school funding and I'm bunking off a French class. I did. So we went outside. And well, your mum knows now anyway. Yeah, she knows. She's yeah, heard exactly. this story a million and one times. So there's me and my mum. <laughs> no, sorry, me and Louise. And we... <laughs> see, look. See, <laughs> so there's me and Louise and Sophie and... Um, do you know Martine McCutcheon as well? EastEnders, right, so anyway, so then we, so we bunked off the French class and we did this whole drama thing to get out. Oh, I've lost my contact lens! Oh, quick, we need to go to the floor! Oh, we scarfed, so we're out there. Then there was a, like a, you know, like a phone box in those days, didn't have mobile phones, showing my age. So we're going, hi, uh, we rang the number and it goes, hi, Polydor Records, click, we hung up. And I was like, fudge, it's real! So at the time we were thinking he was just like, you know, trying to crack on with her, but actually he was a real record producer, so we're like... Fudge, now we've got a phone back and pre- pretend like we're really adult and grown up about this. So they were like, Kelly, you do it. And I was like, great. So I phoned the number, I put the coin in. I said, Polydor Records, this is me. Trying to be grown up. Hi, I just wondered if I could speak to Dennis Inglesby, please. Whatever. So anyway, it was him. He was a real record producer. He invited Louise down. He was putting together the group. And, and then she just said, look, my best mate can sing really well do you mind if she comes along as well? Because at the time, one of the girls that was in the group, they booted her out. Now, should I not have kind of clogged on that that would be the case later on down? Anyway, I'll leave that there. Be good, Kelly. That's how it started. Is that how it started? Yeah. And um, so how... I know that there's obviously quite a lot of bands that have been created like this. So how much input did you have in, in, in the whole process of what happened when the name, putting the group together... Um, you know, we were fortunate because we were, we were born in a time where 
music was still about being creative and having a development process and, you know, kind of finding your own feet and finding your own sound. And we were born in a stable at the time with Zena Carroll and m and all kinds of different bands that <coughs> were given the freedom to develop as an artist rather than just sort of being marketed, put together. Not that I have anything against, you know, X Factor and all of those types of shows for putting bands together, but we just weren't, we weren't created in a time like that. So we did get time to kind of work together. The name Eternal came up because, oh, it was, it takes, it was Take That's manager at the time. And he was like, what about Eternal? And we were like, Eternal's in the Bible. Eternal means last forever. Okay, fine, let's go for that. And that's kind of how it happened. I know. I'd like that story to be more glamorous, but it, it wasn't. <laughs> what an amazing journey. I mean, 10 million uh, records, 14 top and 15 UK hits. Uh, 10 albums, was it? Top 10 albums. It, it must have been such an amazing journey. I mean, from I don't know, getting into the club and then all of a sudden. How long did the whole process take? Um, <clears throat> we, we started in 1992. Um, I was that 15-year-old girl running around in, you know, big baggy jeans and Timberland boots and, you know, flying off to New York. And, um, and it, it's, a, it's a really difficult thing to explain because your feet don't hit the ground you're just going and going and going and there is um you know you're flying and you're you you fly you stop you perform you fly you stop you perform you drive you stop you perform you do an interview you drop your mic it's you know it's it it's a it's a very difficult thing to articulate because it's it's more of an experience rather than and, you know, and you get moments of highlights like meeting the Pope or, you know, um, you know meeting Whitney Houston. I was completely starstruck. I was just, like, just sitting next to me on the plane and we're doing the same gig. I was like, what, doing the same gig? What, this is Whitney Houston, what are you talking about? And I just sat there for the whole journey going... <laughs> I did, like, the absolute kid going, it's really nice to see you, really irritating, you know, like one of those really irritating people that won't let you sleep on the plane. It's really nice to see you, I'm so glad to be here. Oh, the whole flight, you know, she probably hated me. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's, it's very difficult to surmise because it's, it's a combination of experiences. And, you know, what's difficult, I guess, about my experience with the band is that it's that awful thing of kind of getting what you always want, what you think you always wanted, and then finding out that it's really not what you thought it was going to be. I don't know if anyone's ever shared that, but because I was so bullied within that environment, it kind of tarnishes your, your dream, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, but I had to find a way through all of that and, you know, and be sort of... And, and I still have a, a massive heart of gratitude for that whole experience. I mean... I wouldn't be who I am without it and I wouldn't have had the opportunities that I've had without it. So how many years did did, was caused the whole ride until you eventually, well, left the band and...? Um, So it was eight years and it was... um, it, it, It was really fast, a very fast eight years and... And I, and I just wish that I'd had moments like this where I'd come to events where I'd been able to maybe l- look at it from somebody else's perspective before getting into it myself, because then I think I would have had a different experience. What advice would you give yourself now? Oh, God. <sighs> Stand up for yourself. Mm. I'm OK. Mm. Like, who you are is OK. Mm. Right? Well, that comes with age and wisdom, doesn't it? Come. Mm-hmm. If you're interested in finding your true purpose, if you're interested in finding your legacy, if you're interested in growing, if you are sick and tired of reading books that don't help you, haven't helped you, or are not helping you, or attending courses and seminars that haven't really had an impact in your life, I invite you to read my book, The Question, Find Your True Purpose, out now. For more information, go to www.thequestion.co. If you're interested in working with me, contributing to the magazine, Maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing The Best You, go to www.thebestyou.co. So after you left the band, which was very stressful and traumatic, and I don't want to go into that, 
But obviously you started, well, what you discovered afterwards and not feeling well. Tell us a little bit about that part of, of your journey. Um, I was diagnosed with um, SLE disease, which stands for systemic lupus erythematosus. So it's a blood disease that affects the white blood cells. And in normal people, those white blood cells are there to fight infection. Mm -hmm. But in lupus sufferers, they become overactive. And so in, um, in 1998, after I got the sack from the group, publicly sacked, I was... I could woke up one morning, couldn't bend my finger. Um, and then that kind of spread to the rest of my, of my hand. And then I got um, ulcers in my mouth, on my face, down my body. And then eventually I wasn't able to move. And then uh, after a very long process of diagnosis, um, I was then diagnosed with lupus. I know all the things you've gone through what, from what I've read and, and obviously having met you at the Expo last year. I mean, you're obviously a fighter and you've kept coming back and coming back. But you, you're obviously a patron uh, for lupus and creating awareness of it. Tell us a little bit more about kind of what, what your passion is regarding helping others understand the effects it has on, on people. <clears throat> well, I think the, the, the difficulty with lupus is that most people don't know what it is and if they've heard of it, they don't understand it. Mm. And so there's very little sympathy or empathy for lupus sufferers. Mm. There's very little support for lupus sufferers. Um, and so um, as a patron, I, I'm committed to, to changing that in, in whatever simple way that I can. Um, so I do things like garage sales and... Um, to raise money and awareness. And um, I've been, you know, working really hard. I mean, just my recent bout of uh, lupus was quite severe because it was on my brain. No. And so I lost power of speech and movement and three days of my life. So when you go through... You very quickly learn to appreciate things. Mm, I can imagine. But you've always got a smile. <laughs> it's important. Um, I was reading that Selena Gomez, a seal, yeah. and uh, Tony Braxton. Yes. They all suffer with, uh, with the virus as well. Yeah, and Tony's still out there touring yeah. with, a, with a pacemaker. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's incredibly inspiring what, the human <clears throat> spirit and will will, you know, enable you to do. Mm, absolutely. Well, yours is an amazing story of inspiration as far as I can see. And uh, as I said, I remember at the Expo last year how, how successful and how people were, you know, blessed and, and honoured to be there with you. Now, within your role as the CEO of Advocate Agency, your, your agency where you help and advise all sorts of upcoming talent and established talent, what advice do you give them and, and how do you help people? <coughs> I think what's, excuse me, what's unique about AA is that it forms an umbrella for people. Even just the shape of the word advocate agency forms a, an umbrella for people, a place where they can feel safe. Most of my clients are misfits, people that wouldn't necessarily be looked at as favourable to, to be signed, but equally what what holds them all together is that they're all incredibly talented people who deserve a right, who have a voice, who should be heard. Mm. Similar to what I do in terms of as a patron of St. Thomas Lupus Trust, that, I, you know, I, I speak on behalf of people that maybe aren't able to speak for themselves. And that's ironic when I wasn't able to speak for myself, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, what's unique about Advocate Agency is that most people on our books wouldn't necessarily have an opportunity to shine. And I think I really, I, I, I totally know how that feels as being that little girl at school that no one could give a monkeys about and didn't think deserved to be there. So I think I just totally have a pull for that, for those types of people. I'm not silly. They have to be talented. <laughs> like, you know, you've, you've, got, you've got to come with your stuff. But I think I just have that kind of heart for people like that. It's a different era, obviously, when you 
you know, when you got into Eternal, YouTube, yeah. social media. What do you think the best assets are the most important assets for people to have to succeed, mm -hmm. let's say, in this industry, for example? Well, in this industry, it's, about, it's all about your brand and who you are and, and understanding who you are. Because lots of people, you know, in terms of casting and cast types, there are so many. But what I tend to speak to people about um, is about finding who you are. What's your USP? But in, as a, in, a, in, a ter in terms of as an entertainer, it's really important to, to know what separates you from your, from, your, from your peers, from your competition. Who are you? Because then you'll get the role because no one else can play it but you. Mm. And I think that's what, that's what I try to establish within my clients and in the roster is, is finding what makes you unique because that's what people will actually want to buy because nobody else can recreate that. Mm. That's great advice. Uh, would you say you've had several... Uh, uh, with a lot of people I've interviewed over the years, <coughs> um, i found... Yeah. Thank you. I was saying with a lot of people that I've interviewed over the years, i found that um, there's normally, normally a, a common denominator where, where people have a turning point in their life that, you know, puts them on the path that, you know, I don't know, life gives them. Have you had such a turning point? Many. Many? <laughs> no, many. I think there are, you know, those um, crossroads where you can choose left or right, and I think I've had many of those um, times. I, I think studying for my master's was, was key time because it was learning, and, and I was able to commit myself to study. And being told, I mean, I failed every single GCSE other than English and drama. Funny that, huh? <laughs> but it just shows that, you know, if you don't come from an academic place or, or background or it doesn't, it, it shouldn't hold you back. It, it hasn't held me back. It's made me fight harder. Um, and I think there are just styles of learning and that's what's key is that you need to find your way, what suits you, what do, how do you like to learn? And I think that's what's more important and that's what I try to instill into my children, you know. Regan is, Regan is five and Kaori is three. Kaori is, well, just a, like a force of nature <laughs> and, uh, and Regan is incredibly smart but... He doesn't learn in a, in, a, in a straightforward sense. So, like I was teaching, for example, I was teaching him to write his name. And he was like, Mummy, I don't get how the R goes round this way. And da, 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 da. So I said, OK, let's make an R physically. We'll lie on the floor and we'll make an R. So he goes like this, we go like this, da, 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 and sticks out like that. And he goes, oh, that's an R. And I go, yeah. He goes to the paper, goes... Ah, oh, I get it. Because for him, it needs to be physical. It needs to be kinesthetic. He needs to be able to feed it. It needs to be tangible. And so, you know, I think that's what was key with me. I needed to learn in the way that I could, that, was, that made sense to me. Mm. And so doing, yeah, so studying for my master's was, was key because I, I got to learn differently. And out of the parameters of fail, pass, A, B, C, D. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Mm. Well, it's one of the things that we normally share when kind of you speak to people about what we do or, you know, the kind mm -hmm. of business that we're involved in, personal, professional growth. But really what it is, is it's simply education, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's about learning. Yeah. And I think the older we get, we're, the, the quicker and the more we learn that how important it is well, that's to carry on learning. One of the reasons I came tonight is to learn from Sharon. Mm -hmm. Just want to listen and learn. <laughs> Grow. Uh, you were saying that it's important for people to understand their own USB and obviously understand also... What they, what they stand out for, what would you say your best assets are? Helping others. Um, that's when I'm at my best. When I feel like I've helped something, helped someone, helped, helped in some way. Um, in, in uh, I guess, biblical terms, an exhorter, someone that encourages, supports, lifts up. That's what I think I'm best at. Doing it. Uh, anybody who inspires you now? You do? No. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much. No. But what you've done is incredible, and what you're doing is incredible. Thank you. Um, my children inspire me greatly. Um, 
Oprah Winfrey inspires me. My friend Bibi inspires me. Like, I keep people around me that I aspire to, that I respect, that, um, that drive me, because, you know, I'm, I guess, a little bit self-deprecating. Is that the right word? <laughs> yeah. So I, I need people around me that go, come on, you can do it. Come on, stop whinging, stop moaning, get on with it. My husband's a bit like that. Do you have a whinger? No, he's like, come on, stop whinging. All right, you've fallen on your face. Get up and get on with it. Okay. You know, he's a bit like that, you know. Oh, and if I'm stuttering, he goes, hurry up, I've only got five minutes. <laughs> I know, bless him. He's not here tonight, funnily enough. Because that's what he'd say, I'm serious. He'd go, come on, love, we've got to get the kids to bed. Can you hurry up? <laughs> you, you mentioned very briefly before, you, we were talking about, um, you know, the... X Factor or The Voice. Yeah. What are your thoughts about these programmes? You know, <coughs> trying to find fame. Yeah, I think they're great platforms, but what I, what I don't like about those shows is there's the lack of support afterwards. Mm. And that's when they come to me. <laughs> My books are made up of people that have gone through like, those kind of situations and then go, now what? I thought I was going to be famous. What are you talking about? <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, I think the support systems afterwards need to be put in place. I mean... You know, I did, like, um, a reality TV show called Love Island, and what they didn't tell me is what happens to you afterwards. Because, you know, 24 hours a day, people are watching you and seeing what you do, what you get, what you like in the morning, when you go to bed, da da da, da when you get up, da da da, da. But there's no sort of support systems in place for after that. So what then becomes your reality? Do you know what I mean? And how you actually function then in life again, like as a normal person. And so a lot of people from, you know, programmes like X Factor and things like that. They build you up, hype you up. They go, oh, you're going to be a big star. It's going to change your life forever. And yes, it will. But how do you actually manage that on a real basis when you don't win or when you're runner-up? Or after all of the hype dies down, then what do you do? How do I actually earn a living? How do I, you know, all of those very practical, real things that you need to know. No one tells you what to do then. And so, yeah, I think they're great, but the aftercare isn't really put in place. If you're interested in watching the video content of this interview and many others, or interested in learning from world leaders and teachers, go to www.thebestyou.online. What's your thoughts regarding education? You've got kids, you've gone through the school system, and what are your thoughts regarding the educational system and what needs to change? Ooh, we could be here a long time. But no, um, I chose my schools for my children, my, for, for Regan, really specifically because we live in quite a rural area where everybody is uh, predominantly white. And I know what racism is like. I went, I experienced it as a child growing up from primary school. So I didn't want that to happen, but equally I wanted him to have a really good education. And I, I, you know, we'd moved out of London so I didn't have to pay for private education. I'm sorry, but it's so expensive. Like, I could buy him two flats for that, you know what I mean? So that's the decision that we made as a family. Um, and education for me is, is essential, but it's not, it's not isolated to school. Like, I don't go, here you go, here's my child, educate it, please. And if it doesn't get an A, it's your fault. That's, no, as far as I'm concerned... It, school is a great place to start a learn, you know, a great learning environment where you get trained certain things. But I have that responsibility, so I teach him about. We go to museums, we go to, we travel, we, do, you know. So for me, it's not for me. It's it's school isn't his education. School is a place to go to learn certain things, but it's my job to educate him because I think it's a lot broader than what's in the school curriculum. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. You're absolutely right. I mean, parents have a responsibility in guiding, you know, uh, yeah. kids through. And I, th I think we're, we're, as I said, we're so blessed with, with kind of what the, the, we're so lucky with technology nowadays. Mm. You, know, um, you can learn anything on YouTube. I mean, you can even teach your cat how to play the piano. Yes, absolutely. So My son, son and I were talking about DNA, and so he said, Mummy, what's DNA? And I went, that <laughs> that's my answer for everything so we googled it and i learned quite a lot actually so it's it's and it's fun because you're learning together and it's it's wonderful exactly mm -hmm. uh, so what's next well my target was to be well to be able to string together a sentence 
to be able to dress myself, walk from here to there. So when you've got bars like that that have set for yourself, um, every day is a triumph, you know, because I'm like, you know, being here tonight is fills you with fear because you think, God, I've got to speak in front of people. How am I going to string together a sentence? You know what I mean? How do I make sense? Because one of uh, one of the difficulties with lupus is because it was on my brain, I now sh- suffer with short-term memory loss. So speaking is one thing. Woo, managed to do that. You've all understood me, haven't you? Yes. Good. Um, but short-term memory loss means that I don't remember where I parked my car funny yeah when you haven't got 10 parking tickets because you don't know when you parked <laughs> right okay yeah. right right and where I've got to walk with a bum bag all the time now bum bags were kind of trendy in the 80s but you know wrapped around a really nice evening dress <laughs> right you know doing stairs right not very right so for me small accomplishments but meaning the world to me and my family around me who've been carrying me for such a long time and seeing me being independent is like, yay. Um, I am on Loose Women next week, Monday. (laughs) Um, Which is lovely. So I've got lovely, lovely things to come, which is really nice because kind of recovering was was my focus. But now I can get on with living life. Well, it's funny. When when you have something like that, your priorities change instantly. Mm and automatically just overnight, don't they? Yeah. And the important things. Absolutely. Uh, so, many, many, many years from now, what would you like your legacy to be? <sighs> many years from now. Well, even if it was now, which is a reality for me, you know, like um, on a gravestone, this is not, I'm not going to be morbid. <laughs> I can't, you know, really morbid. No, it's not me. But... You know, on the gravestone they have uh, Kelly Bryan and then they have your birth date and then there's the dash and then there's the end date. I'd love the dash to be, she never gave up. Well, thank you so much. That was beautiful, lovely. Really enjoyed it. Sorry, I'm not very um, eloquent and stuff. What I'm are you sorry about, about that. You're absolutely brilliant. I just, because otherwise, I can't, just better off being myself, <laughs> right? So sorry about that. Nothing to apologise. Just do who I am. No- all right. Nothing to apologise. No, just no. I've been myself. Yeah. Like this, you, what you see is what you get. I'm not going to be anything other than that. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much for watching Inspiring People. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Just wait a second, Kelly. Uh, just a couple of questions. If, if oh, we'll take, sure. take a seat, yeah. if you don't mind. We'll, just well, you know I can't walk in these shoes, so <laughs> might as well sit down. I'll hold your hands. Yes. Okay. Yes? Oh, okay. Sorry. Kelly, thank Hi. you so much for tonight. You're just so inspiring. I didn't know any of your story. You just are oh, wonderful. And I have just one question. Did you walk that way? Where's your shoes? <laughs> they can't walk Every in. woman here is thinking, where do you get the shoes? <laughs> Not every woman, but... Thank you. Can't walk in them, so don't buy them. Just kidding. No, they're from ASOS. Oh, I love ASOS. I can't believe that's the question, but anyway, I can't believe that's the question. Okay. The greatest question. It is, uh, for a woman, I understand. Absolutely. Um, yes. Listen, they're lovely, lovely shoes. Thank you. Any other question related to her dress or, quest- or shoes? <laughs> It was difficult because um, at the time I was going through litigations because I decided to fight because they were like, take this, leave quietly. And I said, no, 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 no. I haven't endured the last eight years of bullying to leave quietly. And that doesn't mean that I wanted to have some retribution and be out there and go, hey, this me. that's not my point. But I didn't want my bullying to be silenced. That's what's not acceptable. 
to me, anyway, personally. So, um, so it was a difficult time because I was having to, you know, I was dealing with lawyers and da 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 da. And it, can I not do this on camera? This bit on camera for a second. You don't want to do this on camera. No, because I'd like to answer a question. Yeah, no, absolutely. Real, we'll, we'll, and we'll I don't want to. It's yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, so basically, I was in litigations at the time, and they take. So basically, they'd frozen my money. So, all of my money was in the group accounts, which was frozen. So I can't touch my money. I'm in litigations. I've been sacked from my job, and you think I'm going to go quietly? Hell friggin' no. <laughs> so, in that situation, I had. It was about. It's like fighting for life. It's like no, I haven't endured all of this for eight years for nothing. So you. Dig your heels in as much as you can, even if they look fabulous like these. You just, <laughs> you just dig your heels in and you find a way. And you have people like Bibi and you have people that, that just go, don't worry, sleep on my floor, it's fine. Don't worry, I'll feed your kids, it's fine. We'll get through this. And yes, I won and yes, I got my money and yes, I was able, then I was able to go, yay! <laughs> you know, but in those quiet moments, you just, if you need to hide, you hide. Like, it's fine, there's no shame in that. Because you need to recover somewhere and you need the privacy to be able to do that and be selective with the people that you do that with. Because in my situation, I have somebody out me and tell a story and say, oh, look, she's this and she's that and she's working. I had to put my... It was awful. I mean, like, I had this photographer following me around on a motorbike and he took a picture of me in a not a very nice situation. And Right, so if you need to hide, there's no shame in that because you need to recover. So if you had that 15 minutes of fudge, shit, bleh, 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 which we all have them, <coughs> retreat, hide, cry, whatever it is you need to do, give yourself time to recover. You're human. Yeah? It hurts. It's real. Being sacked is real. Being, going, you're going through your humiliation is real. Give yourself time to recover. Shut down, recover. Feed on the right things like this. Feed, 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 feed. Then when you're ready, still I rise. Do you know what I'm saying? Then snap. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.